my name is Mark, as, as Victor has introduced me, and uh, uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, is just a, a so, sort of analysis of what we've been trying to do collaboratively locally and in the region, and uh, what uh, one, health, one health efforts that have been building mo mo momentum for the last decade. Um, I am a visiting scientist here at Hillary, and I work with Eric Fav under the, the Horn project, uh, the Horn project in the middle. And um, we have been working with many other organizations. So uh, currently, we are advising the government of Kenya through the Zoonotic Disease Unit as uh, the FAO Acted Program to develop uh, policies and guidelines, uh, for example, what uh, Gasa has just talked about. That's one of our outputs that we are we're going to, you know, the, the momentum to go that. So um, the outline of my presentation is that I I just want to give a snapshot of global, regional, and, and local efforts of what has been happening and, and to show the interconnectedness of how this is an additive way of having a common achievement. Uh, when you work together in one health, you bring together very many these disciplines. The focus for this talk is that we want to see how implementation moves to operationalize and finally how you can institutionalize because you need to embed this into national policies as you move forward. And um, uh, why do we need to, to develop policies? Or why do we need to develop guidelines? I think apart from the planning financially, you need to have uh, sort of agreements where um, if you want to have an outcome, you're looking at specific public health hazards, you're looking at specific emerging uh, diseases or foodborne diseases as uh, a previous speaker here from, I think Richard talked about, you need a common way of looking at it. And the plants here have been ignored for a very long time, but then we are seeing them sneaking in here as part of the One Health in a, a shared environment. So that's where we need it to help us to plan better, but at the same time also to help us actually just to have a common way of working from uh, the, the various se sectors that are involved in this. But it's a long process, and this is not a template for, for, for Kenya, but this is just a general way that probably how policies will be developed. For some of us who have been involved in developing guidelines and strategies for the country, this is a common approach that you have to use. But the most important thing is after you review the available material and literature that exists, is relevant to One Health or infectious diseases, you need actually to go to the stakeholders and then develop a framework that is now go going to have a governance structure whereby it has to have a political buy. -in. So apart from having accountability issues, that you need partners and, and people actually to buy in into your story, there has to be a, a document that actually guides you. And that's why it's very important to do this. But M and E is very important in terms of doing this. At FAO, we have developed the One Health monitoring tool that takes account and it takes you a stepwise way actually to understand on are you having investments that are realistic or are you just throwing your money into implementing One Health pro pro programs? On December 1st this year, uh, the One Health Expert Panel that has been 26 individuals from various countries, we are privileged to have our own Kenyan Salome Bukashi actually sitting in this panel and they redefined One Health. And uh, previously it has been silent on plant uh, health. But now we are seeing an ecosystems approach whereby for sustainable way to balance and optimize health, not just for human beings, you have to actually look at the ecosystems and the animals that exist in this system. So this definition is going to create an impetus for us forward. This is, is going to uh, ignite a lot of collaboration to coordinate this, also to focus on issues of one health uh, workforce capacity building. And at the same time, you want to communicate better to the stakeholders. So, I mean, this December, this has been a milestone in terms of just bringing this uh, uh, out uh, very clearly. But the most important thing is that the trapezoid, which is composed of FAO, which chairs the trapezoid right now, and OIE and WHO, has been very systematic actually in developing tools. The TZG is a, is a very good template that actually allows you to understand how collaborations are done, uh, how well are uh, probably at what extent can you define a zoonotic disease? Is AMR and food safety part of this? Has AMR or food safety been ignored? And I think these are some of the issues that have been, and I liked uh, the previous speakers actually who touched on issues to do with food safety, that we sometimes we put it on the backdrop and don't really want to bring it on the forefront of this. And countries just adopt this as a template. But the most important thing is that based on a country experience, you have also to have 
a best practice or way of actually implementing this. And that's why it's very important actually to see what the chapters have been doing uh, over the years. So the TZG will actually focus on a few areas and these operational tools, they're the ones actually that help us to focus on some key you know, technical areas. And one of the areas that probably I'll just highlight is the, the MCM, what you call the multi-sectoral one health coordination. But we have some technical areas in terms of uh, conducting a joint risk assessment, what we call the JRA and the One Health Workforce Development, which is being done by many organizations, including Afrohun, which has championed this curriculum development in terms of One Health Workforce Development and the, and the UC Davis. So as we move forward, these tools are the ones which actually guide from the global perspective to the national perspective to be able actually to adopt are some of these tools. And some of the documents probably that we have contributed for over some time is that even the World Bank has an interest actually in funding One Health Research and provides um, a very good, uh, if you go online and look at uh, ReadySea, you will see actually what they do. And this is like a blueprint, which, which actually they use to, to, to take stock and maybe prioritize areas that are going to fund. And AMR actually is emerging very strongly as we move forward. So we move from the global level and then we come to the African Union. The African CDC and uh, the auspices of, of the African Union based in Addis Ababa has for over the years actually championed now by endorsing a One Health approach, by creating these fr frameworks that are actually going to be best pr 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 practices in tackling uh, what we call zoonotic diseases. But the main thing is you have to share your data. You have to establish the systems but at the same time, actually enable to strengthen One Health coordination collaboration. So what we are seeing here is that One Health approach is really taking cent center stage, even at our own African perspective. But then this report here has been highly cited, and I think it was developed by scientists from Ilri here, including Bernard Bett and others. And it actually outlines that we are having spillovers all over the place, from the environment back to the, the ecosystem and we're having, you know, humans, you know, coming in. As you can clearly see, how do we break this chain of transmission? If you're looking at COVID-19, of which this report focuses on, for the first time, the United Nations Environmental Program now becomes the fourth arm of the trapezoid. So we had FAO, OIE, and WHO, and now UNEP comes in, actually, to really bring in the environmental aspect, which we have been actually missing into this. So we can mainstream One Health approaches by building capacity, by enhancing actually what we call M&E and &E, and focusing on governance. And our discussions today are actually going to be on governance. How does governance actually be allowed? And our first tool of the seven tools is the MCM. This is a 10 step, you know, kind of a process whereby you have to take stock and you have to, you know, have a team working together and choose the areas of, of, of of collaboration that you're going to focus on. But the key elements that guide us in terms of moving forward, we, we can be focused on leadership and governance and the policies and legal, legal frameworks. And this is the, the whole discussion that we've been having here. How do you fund activities? What do you base on? Actually, if you want to fund some of these activities, you can't just come out nowhere probably with a big money of bag and then drop it somewhere else. So this, there are very many core elements, but the focus for this talk, we are going to look at leadership and governance and those frameworks that have been established across the continent or across the Horn of Africa and efforts actually to prioritize zoonotic diseases or events. So the MCM actually, it forms a template that guides us as we move forward. And again, this work, I think it was a commission by Oreca, uh, led by Fasina, uh, who we, we also work with. And you look at, the, the, the way they have mapped out all these organizations and come up with many of these activities. And these activities keep on varying. But the most important thing that you have to look at is that we are narrowing this to only the human and animal issues. And this is actually the weakest link that as we move forward. This study did a very interesting thing because actually tried to look at the powers of interest. So you want to see how does actually power influence whether they're decision makers or funders in that. And uh, conversely, you find that in terms of you can have a very good correlation between the interest and influence in terms of decision making, but then you find there's some you know, poor correlation and this can be actually influenced by sector specific priorities, whereby 
you have the policies that are segmented to each sector, but they are not really merging into the other. So I think I like this uh, uh, work that actually Oreka uh, uh, had a, a, lot, a lot of input in, which was published, and it gives us a lot of uh, uh, focus where we can see where activities are done. For example, uh, the East African region uh, has taken a huge lead over other areas, whereby you find that over probably 100 and so initiatives, activities are being done in the East African region. But what is happening in the in the in the in the in the in the western part of, of Africa and probably the, the southern part? So we need to bring together these continental efforts actually to see land-based practices from other, other areas of the of the of the continent. And actually, as we move forward and understand this, and this actually propelled us to um, understand, uh, for example, what has been happening in our country as Kenya. I'll be a bit biased because I'm Kenyan and just trying to give a story of how, you know, the Kenyan Zoonotic Disease Unit was established. The Kenyan Disease, the ZDU is the national uh, One Health platform, actually, which had been just presented by the previous speakers, uh, Jasa Augusta. And this has been a long journey, I think all the way from probably almost 30 years ago when we had the, the Kenya Rabies group that was under, you know, the South, and East African uh, re rabies group. So due to the sporadic emergences of, of these cases, but this journey actually gained momentum in 1998, 1999, when we had the 1997 Rift Valley fever outbreak, which was huge uh, 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 in the East African region. The, the technical committee has been in existence for all these years until even the outbreaks that have happened during the 2021 or 2020 in the East African region. But the milestones that happened beyond the, the HPI task force was in 2012, when they were able actually to develop a strategic plan, which actually was endorsed by both ministers of health and at that time, Minister of Livestock to come up with the first strategic plan that actually brought to the establishment of the Zoonotic Disease Unit. But a very, very significant uh, effort happened, I think, in 2014, when we were able actually to develop the national strategic plan, which was being led by the ZDU and a lot of support from other organizations like uh, the WSU, uh, led by Dumbi and others. And then we moved forward very quickly to this year, actually, to showcase some of the, the One Health strategic plan, uh, the anthrax that she was presenting, and also the brucellosis uh, uh, control and prevention strategy. So we have this trilogy of, of documents that we are going to launch very soon that actually are going to put Kenya on the, the global stage actually as, as a leading force in terms of actual implementation of that. So after we look at how the ZDU is structured, and I think she had mentioned this, so I always really want to be able on this. The main emphasis that I, on the left side is that do we have a need to co-opt other sectors? Do we need the environment to bring in the environment actually to provide support for this? Do we need to bring in wildlife monitoring? So while the core functions are being run by vets and medical epidemiologists who run the, uh, the, the entire unit, it also cascades lower to the county one health units, which I'll be talking about in the next slide, up to the sub-county sub level. But the most significant thing is to bring together all these sectors as per defined by the recent definition of one health by uh, the expert panel, that probably we need to look beyond just these two disciplines and expand this. For us to institutionalize one health approach, we need evidence also from these other sectors. And this is what we call the county one health units. In 2015, um, we piloted the county one health units with the, with the CDC office in Kenya to actually try to mirror what is happening at the national level and we can bring it down to see if the same thing can be done at the county level. And in 2021, with the support from uh, the Global Implementation Solutions, uh, we have been able actually to develop the County One Health curriculum that are based on tools of surveillance, joint response, uh, probably AMR, communication, um, risk assessment, and so on and so forth. But some of these modules were heavily borrowed from Afrohun. And Afrohun, as most of you know, I think Helen talked about it yesterday, and Sam is in the room also here is that their leaders actually in terms of the One Health Workforce Development. So from bridging the academia aspect and bringing in together the industry, developing these curriculums actually has helped the ZDU that will now go down to put down courses on data sharing information. How well can we coordinate this? 
And then finally, our big story of policy and legislation. So the County One Health Unit, again, will put Kenya on the global map because we are going to see how you can trickle down actually the way to implement and decisionalize One Health. And I, I bring this story by uh, this paper from Uganda, which actually has also showcased their journey that began way, way back. I think they began in 1980 when the veterinary public health division was embedded in the Ministry of Health. And this pro probably was a milestone at that time, but they have come a long, a long way tackling African trypanosomiasis. And I think in 2017, uh, from this publication by uh, this team, they had their National One Health Platform. But there's some uniqueness about their National One Health Platform that is not in our Kenyan one. You find that they have the high level One Health Technical Working Group that has all these direct of animal resources, direct of health services, but a key thing, they have the environment embedded in and wildlife. And so these are some of the, the lessons that we can learn that while we have ours strongly embedded into only two sectors, other countries actually have elevated it and actually brought it. And even down to the district level, what we call for our case, the county one health unit. So East African countries or countries across Africa can learn from each other actually on how to operationalize and implement most of the one health programs. And you need a lot of resources actually to go ahead and do this kind of thing. So I'll not really go one by one, but for you to plan better, to share information very well, you need frameworks. And some of these frameworks are set, for example, the AHR uh, by the WHO, you have the terrestrial guide by OIE, and then you have the CODIS elementaries. But the most important thing is you have to have the expert networks. The way there's not technical working groups work in these countries is that they are led by the twin directors of health. But then they have subject matter experts being led by researchers from ILRI, KEMRI, and other organizations actually, which provide support for this. So we have the National Action Plan for Security in place, for example, in Kenya, and all these other documents that actually can guide us to move forward. This can be replicated in any other country because you, this is, is uh, uh, what probably, uh, when you are developing the strategies for Rwanda, we had this kind of approach that we used. And what is a joint external evaluation? So this is a very systematic way of looking at pandemic preparedness. And you have about 19 key steps that you have to go through. It is a voluntary process, but again, it enables you after every five years actually to review. Now it will tell you if a country has the ability to respond well to an infectious disease. Kenya did its JE in 2017. And what we saw after having this and the ZDU took lead into this, that all these 17 areas of capacity. We focus, for example, on the global health security agendas packages, which we have this notice package, we have the AMR package and other package. So in line with the global health security agenda, what we are looking at, where are we as a country and where are we going? If you have a score of one, then we are doing too badly. But if we have a score of about four, then we are doing very well. And in Kenya, you can see, for example, AMR, um, and maybe I'll focus on zoonotic diseases here. You find that surveillance systems for, for, for the zoonotic disease and mechanisms actually to do this. And we are at three, so meaning that we have some capacity going forward. But then you find that we have probably an area on antimicrobial resistance. We had two, so some limited capacity, but this was in 2017. So the purpose of the JEE, which will be tied together to what we call the performance of veterinary services, is to try and bridge the gap of what is happening on the side of the human health via the AHR guidelines, which were developed in 2005, and what is going to happen actually on the, on the, on the veterinary side. And that brings us to this activity that we did last month uh, we brought together experts from uh, the WHO, led by the WHO regional office. And the ZDU coordinated this with the animal health experts, human health experts. And it's very important to bridge the gap. So if you want to move forward and have a platform of probably establishing how to institutionalize this, the One Health is a commonality between what happens in the human health and what happens in the, in the animal health. And what the PVS and IHR Bridging Workshop does is that it tries to harness those areas of commonality, those weaknesses that exist in both systems. And this will be what will be prioritized by the country. So we were able actually to prioritize key areas that have been listed here. We had about 12, but we started with looking at the joint risk assessment will be very key to look at that. But those are more technical. The most priority that we are looking at as a country right now is that for us to move the ZDU from where it exists under the directorates to a higher office, probably under the presidents, 
So if you, you establish that directorate, and I'll talk about that at the end, is that now you can have more funding and you can actually prioritize that. But you have all this continent flowing together between what happens in the veterinary aspect and what happens actually in the, in the public health aspect. So this is the main purpose of the HR and the PVS. And this work took us a lot of time under the Horn project. And what we wanted to do is that we went out there and we wanted to understand what has been reported in the Horn of Africa. Where has it been reported? Which country has done a lot of work on this? And all the publications that have been churned all over the years, we were able to, to synthesize all these publications. And this work was led by my colleague, Lisa, who we work with. And we were able actually, for example, you can see that Uganda, Ethiopia, and Kenya, I've just picked a few. We did Somali, Djibouti, and all that. And where you see the red line on that graph is when they had prioritized the zoonotic diseases. So at that time, you realize that probably the number of publications might start going up because focus is being given to specific diseases that you're going to work with. But the most important thing is you want to analyze which domain, where are we having the interface? If you look at the Venn diagrams that you're bringing together, you find that as we want to prioritize these diseases, rabies takes a huge share probably on the human aspect where the analysis is being done. And anthrax, brucellosis, Rift Valley fever, and all those diseases. But then you find that the human, the animal aspect actually predominates all these sectors in terms of whether they are doing risk surveys, whether they're doing epidemiology studies, or just probably CAP studies. This work actually uh, was sort of, uh, you know, going back and trying to understand what has been happening in the region for over the years. So we call this paper actually 100 years of scoping, and we are just looking at what is happening in the Horn of Africa. But the most important thing is, based on that paper, which came probably much later, these efforts have been going on to try and prioritize diseases. And why do you want to prioritize diseases? You want to prioritize diseases because that's where you're going to put your money. That's where your policies are going to focus on. And the CDC has designed a tool, uh, what we call uh, the OHZP. And this tool actually is a, is a, is a semi-quantitative tool whereby you want to understand what happens in a country of total disease. So in 2015, in Kenya, on the last map, we actually prioritized those diseases. We started with anthrax, trypanosomiasis, rabies, brucellosis, and rift valley fever. And these were very many, about 35 diseases, but we, you only want to focus on the first five. And the criteria actually is based on few, on few issues. We, you want to see the socioeconomic impact. Does this disease actually really cause loss? Why do you want actually to tackle this disease? Does this disease actually cause severe illness in humans? Or does this disease actually, does it have an epidemic potential slash pandemic potential, what we, what we have seen? And as you can see, many countries have followed the CDC tool to actually operationalize this. Sekemate in 2018 and others actually uh, ranked seven diseases in Uganda, as you can see. But in Nigeria, actually this year, a paper which was published and actually it had also some uh, Kenyan authors, Matthew Muturi and others helped actually to do this process. I mean, you can see rabies is very common in these countries. If you look at, at, uh, at uh, the four countries that we have used across Africa, you find that there's a community of diseases. So it's very important to standardize most of these tools. But this is our biggest achievement so far in the 12 year journey that we've worked. We have actually been able to revise our old strategy. And we have the strategy here, which actually the director of veterinary services was talking about. We're going to launch it very soon and based on the guidelines that are going to be developed. So this, this uh, strategy, the Kenya National One Health Strategy, is a blanket of two other strategies that will come down here, what Augusta was talking about, and also we have a resources strategy that has to be in place. But the main thing is that the first objective of this actually really, really focuses on implementation issues and industrialization. The others probably are applied research, which will see the importance of doing applied research, and probably just to, to strengthen surveillance. So I think this is a very big step for Kenya as we move into the, the, the next phase to try in the next five years actually to roll out this strategic plan and probably have more impetus to see if we need to summarize into a policy document. But based on the two things that I talked earlier, the JE and the PVS, which you're now familiar with trying to find those you know, areas of convergence or weaknesses both in the human health and animal health, Kenya developed a national action plan for health security um, in 2017. And this, when you look at this 
uh, National Action Plan for Health Security, it really brings out the strength of capacity building when you're looking at the One Health approach. These institutional capacities that you want actually to implement issues to do IHR, it's mandatory actually to bring in the One Health approach. And that's why the contributions of both sectors after undertaking the stock of the PVS and the JEE, they came up to develop this document, which is now being funded. Actually, it is a costed uh, strategic plan, which is actually going to propel the country forward. And as I said, uh, being a Kenyan, I'll be very, very uh, systematic. So we, we have the, the, the avian influenza contingency plan, and we are re recently about to, to revise the Rift Valley Fever Contingency Plan, which has been worked on for many, many years, actually by leading researchers in, in, uh, in Rift Valley Fever in this country. And the purpose of this is that you keep on updating it because you want to create guidelines and SOPs that you're going to use. But I mentioned the, the rabies plan uh, as earlier in the discussion, and then Augusta just talked about the anthrax uh, strategy. And then also we also have uh, this uh, brucellosis and the One Health strategy that we have, we have launched. So I think as we move forward, we are seeing the outputs of the efforts that we are putting in as a country. And another project that I was involved in, this we funded by WHO and TDR in, in Baringo, Kenya, and Edna Mtua yesterday actually presented part of uh, the findings from this study, uh, part of the anthropological work, is that you can develop policies or strategies at a much lower level. So when we went to Baringo, Kenya, and we conducted the One Health study between malaria and Rift Valley fever in these populations, and we were able actually to create policy briefs, both for malaria and a policy brief for Rift Valley fever. And this policy brief has been used by Baringo County, and probably it can be emulated by other neighboring counties, which have probably the same ecological drivers of this disease. So it's very important actually to see on how you can unpackage all these issues from the much higher level, and then you move forward. Why do you do research? You don't do research just for fancy publishing. You want to do research that is impactful. You want to see these communities actually have these messages that are very simple, and they can be able actually to use these messages actually to protect their livestock, and at the same time protecting themselves from vector-borne diseases like Rift Valley mm -hmm. fever. And FAO commissioned mapping of the One Health activities in Kenya, and this was led by the Zoonotic Disease Unit once again. And what we find here that despite that we have uh, some gains in One Health, our country being covered in a very nice map, and you find that most of the One Health activities probably are more based in areas that have high livestock po uh, uh, populations. You see the up north, I think in Marsabit, and probably now we are starting to see a shift so, sort of an epidemiological shift whereby we are seeing now more activities going to areas that are semi-intensive. In, and this is what urbanization does. So you see actually coming up of most of these diseases from areas that probably were not prevalent to, to some of these diseases. We provide this as a template and in terms to operationalize some of these things that this can be emulated by other countries actually. When you map out the activities and you know where you want to go, you know where you want to put your money. So for you to be able actually to move forward, you want to check on the technical areas. And what we looked at, and I'll not really go into all the areas, I'll just look at this one area of institutional policy and legislative frameworks. This came out very prominently. We talked to experts in One Health, in medical research and everything. And it came out very, very clearly that the areas that has, have to be given priority in terms of interventions, these were areas in creating conducive legislative frameworks and at the same time actually creating institutional policies that are going to drive One Health agenda forward. And Part of that, and we are just discussing this with Harry at the break, is that um, how is One Health funded in most of these countries? One Health is funded, being driven by priorities, by the donor organizations or donor countries. When do we have an aspect of probably understanding the priorities of One Health funding are going to be driven by our own courses? Do we have probably budget lines in our countries, for example, Kenya, and the DVS has also provided some support. And now I know the Ministry of Health has actually put a division that actually looks at specifically the, 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 the zoonotic disease unit. So, and in not really becoming biased, this is a, a donor-driven agenda that is actually you know, supporting most of these activities. Well, you see the CDC, the USAID, most of the activities, what we do 100% in FAO are being funded by the Global Health Security Agenda, which is a, GS, a, a USAID pro project. So, all the organizations that are coming in, we need to have a national agenda and a conversation to see where we can put our money and how we can prioritize where to actually, how to control, you know, emerging infectious diseases and more so 
One Health events. And some of the policies that have been in the, in the, in the pipeline for a very long time, we have the health policy, we have the veterinary bill, we have the animal health bill, it's very, very important to see that you can have a bill, but also at the same time, you can have a policy. So we have some acts that are also very active in this country that are actually helping us to move forward. So when you look at existence of some of these uh, policies and you look at the instruments, instruments are now bills. They are not actually policies as such. How is Kenya doing this is that for us to intervene better, for us to prioritize on how we're going to institutionalize this, we need to strengthen our legal frameworks and actually cassette this to a lower level. And this slide is very interesting because um, we, 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 we supported uh, Cameroon actually to do this work and, and more recently actually Tanzania has completed its strategic plan. What comes out very clearly in this uh, comparative you know, outline is that you find in Tanzania the office, the national health platform in terms of governance is placed at the prime minister's office. That's a very high level office. And you find in Cameroon, it follows the same way, a very high office, in the prime minister's office. But in Uganda, as I had mentioned earlier, you can see those signatures. They come from all those health, agriculture, life, environment, and tourism. And then you see, I think in, uh, in Nigeria, again, is also a bit elevated. And now the Nigerian CDC, which is a very, very strong kind of African organization comes in. So we're asking ourselves that we need to have these offices elevated to much higher uh, le levels in government. And this is the story of Kenya. So when we are looking at where the zoonotic disease unit is, it looks like it's somewhere down there. It's very functional. But then our dream actually is to see the zoonotic disease unit move and be a directorate in the office of the president that gives us more muscle. It gives us more power actually to allocate funding as we move forward. And this can be replicated actually at the county level. And I like using this slide for Rwanda. And the question is, it's the only country actually in this region that has a one health policy. And how have they done it? I think they have had the political will. If you have the political will and you can summon actually the expertise to bring together actually on an integrated way of implementing this. So as they have moved forward actually in March, 2021 to have their first uh, one health policy launched, they had previously had the strategic plan that was revised and in 20, uh, 2026. And it's possible, even as we move forward as, as Kenya, probably as a case study, to move now from what we have as a strategic plan and think on having a very small document that we are going actually to present to policymakers to make decisions on what to prioritize and what to find as a country. So um, we collaborate in a lot of work. And, and as I said, principally, HON is what I've been working with the project for HON for a very long time now. We, coming almost to, to the fusion at the end. And uh, up with Eric Fav at the University of Liverpool and uh, advising FAO on these matters. And just to thank the organizers of this conference as OREC, I think uh, being a very new, it's not really an old organization, but it has been able to pull up this kind of a conference. I think that actually gives us an opportunity to share what is going on in the region and probably to hope in future that we're going to have all these things being done in person. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak to you about this. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nanyingi. I think I don't want to belabor and uh, say anything more because most of that discussion will be carried into the next session. But I just want to echo the comments of the Kuala County Veterinary Officer, Dr. Umlai, that says this is light this, this lights a spotlight in the tunnel. I'm not sure which tunnel he's talking about, but maybe yeah, you, you can get it, that it's, a, it's be the beginning of trying to get animal uh, one health into a sort of uh, structured uh, sort of uh, delivery. And there's a lot of uh, good uh, reviews coming from the charts that shows that uh, people are really tracking this. 